and then you, you've got you know you've got these words like anatta, sunya emptiness, sunyata, nibbana, um, words that have no definition. They all you know like or my one of my favorite quotes is from the, there's the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned, and. Uh, so I started contemplating this. Can I imagine? Can I? What is the unborn? Is something unborn? Can I imagine it? Can I create some kind of image of unborn, uncreated, unformed? And then you observe. Mind was observed. My mind goes blank. I can't think. Of, I can't create an image. The closest you can is like a zero or something. <laughs> But that's symbolic, you see. So, uh, just being able to observe the unborn, uncreated, it, it's, it stops your thinking mind. Because you can't conceive it. You can't create, create it into any form. It's, it's formless. But it's certainly recognizable to be aware of, how, like when you, you stop trying to figure it out, and then there's just awareness that has no form to it. But it's certainly conscious and intelligent. It's not, you don't go become a zombie or a ghost. And you're alert. It's your, mind, your, your mind is bright rather than dull and stupid. So then, and, th and then it goes, there's the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. If there was not, there'd be no escape from the born, the created, the form, the condition. There'd be no way out of it. We're stuck in the samsara. No possible way to, to get out of it. It's the hopeless despair of repeating the same things over and over again. And then it goes on. Because there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned, there is the escape from the born, the created, the form, the condition. Well, those two, like you're taking the unborn and born, or created, uncreated and created. But that helps you to discern it here. What's unborn, uncreated. And then your mind, your thinking mind packs up. So then you, you can often that oh, rubbish, I can't ignore it. It just makes me confused. Or, if you bear with that, if you bear with that, eventually you, you kind of sustaining this awareness around not knowing anything. And if you're patient with that, it, it will lead you to a very blissful state. Un, it's unborn, uncreated. You didn't create bliss out of some practice or some kind of intentional you can't, you can't, you know, you can't imagine, you might have views about it, but you can't create this, this unborn, but you can recognize it. And this is what, what mindfulness allows us to do. And this is the whole, whole kind of uh, magnificent of Buddha's teaching. It's so simple, so accurate, but it, 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 it goes by. People don't get it <laughs> because we're, we're very complicated you know we have complicated personalities and emotional needs and karmas and all that so I mean we're, you know it is to me very impressive that you're all here willing to to do this something something in you has, has awakened to this Dhamma and, and otherwise you wouldn't be here and and then that is something to trust. That's what brings you to this monastery. And because uh, you know it's not easy life, and you've got put up with all kinds of irritating frustrations. <laughs> but but it is a form that that is deliberately constructed to help <coughs> help us. And it holds. Like I found like. It whole, it, I tended to can't be very 
all of, you know, like, you know, idealistic and and be scattered all over, you know, and just get so distracted and involved and caught up into so many options and opportunities that that I realized early on I needed to be be in a container that kept kept me from just going out all the time. And of course, here in Thailand, when I met Bung Po Cha, I mean, this is this is where this is what I can, you know, this will probably help me because otherwise, if I just try to do this all on my own, I'll probably just get, you know, the whole tendency, habit tendency was indulgence and and uh, distraction, and then uh, so living within this. The strict Vinaya structure, I didn't find it easy. Because you know, I don't, you know, emotionally, I'm used to just, I was used to doing what I want. But suddenly you're, you're kind of held down and can't do that anymore. But the point is, you observe that, that frustration that comes from having some something you you hit against, you know, you. you you have to either you you leave and and say the hell with it, or you you just conform within the structure, and then and it's a moral structure, so it's not meant to be a kind of tyranny or or you know you're not asked to do uh, harmful acts or violent acts. It's just to not act act on those emotions. So now, like I'm, you know, the, in my monastic life, it's kind of holding within that. Now it's like it's just second nature. It's not like I'm trying to keep the rules and uh, uptight around it and worry. But it's just like, you know, it's, it's the way where I live. It's just ordinary. And then it is. It gives you a sense of. It, 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 because it is a kind of blessing to us, it, to the world, you know, you really, like living in, in Europe for so long, you know, a Buddhist monk from Thailand going off and living in London sounds impossible, you know, from the way I would think, you know, because it's not a Buddhist country. And, big international city and so forth so you but in all those years I've never had any I mean the, you know there's never been any great problem from the external from the government or the people there and the four requisites have been abundant and then the then the uh, uh, respect that people have even though a lot of people don't know what you are, or what, but they there is a sense of this form that some of the form has a maybe it's an archetype of sorts. You know, it has a resonating quality to it. So even in the countries like England or Italy or Portugal, you've got you still see this, this kind of even though people may not know what you are or what you're doing, they do have this sense of your some kind of spiritual person or pilgrim on the path and there are ways of, of trying to define you but it's usually in a way that, that is quite respectful so you know it's like this discerning the unborn and the born it's uh, then, then the thinking mind wants to say, oh, the unborn is better than the born. And then we get into, that's a criticism, isn't it? It's better. That's, that's a critical point. Then you're thinking again. But the discerning, and this, this mindfulness, then allows us to discern the unborn is like this, and the born. And then we can, we can use the born, the creative the form, in terms of, you know, in skillful means, rather than, just blind reactivity and habitual reactions to life. So like, 
the Bacha, you know, he, when he saw this, then he, you know, he used to wonder why he, he started Wat Ba You know, he could have, you know, my idea was that, oh, if I had this inside, I would be off in some peaceful place. I don't want to bother with all this, the society and monks and nuns and all the problems that arise and, and, uh, and then uh, <laughs> and I thought Ajahn Chah you know out of compassion was establishing the, you know monasteries where I could go and, and, and listen and train with him he didn't need it for himself <laughs> but he was you know just using his the remainder of his life and his, his and the wisdom that he he has to help other people to, to see the and in Thailand you know where it is a Buddhist is where Buddhism is so you know it's a dominant religion and and it's part of a culture so you know, Pacha was trying to educate Thai people and say you know you've got this decision tool that you're not using properly. <laughs> <laughs> so he used to he used to scold the ties all the time about all their superstitions and things and assumptions they have around Buddhism and so forth. And and this is what I found so inspiring was the, you know, here was somebody who actually he was informing people in this country what actually is the Buddhist teaching and what is not. And he wasn't saying that you go to hell if you don't, you know, if you believe in ghosts and all this. And he's just saying that this is, you know, to try to awaken people to discerning the value of Buddhism. Because like a, an ancient religion like this gets, you know, over years becomes you know, so many additions. Uh, you know, it, it kind of absorbs other things, and and so much of it it becomes even non-Buddhist. And that's what like Buddha Dasa in in uh, Sun Mo same thing. That when I was a young monk, these were two powerful teachers in Thailand that were really clear and saying, you know, this is this is uh, and this is the path. This is the what the Buddha taught. The rest might be cultural or superstition, animism, or whatever. But, but he was very, you know, very direct and, and oftentimes very fierce with, uh, with people you know, about that. Because he wants out of compassion to, to get people to appreciate what they have rather than just, I'm a Buddhist and you know, I don't really see what that, you know, the the gift that they have, that they maybe they ignore and don't see, you know, see it as just part of a cultural habit. And it, that's where, you know, because Thai Buddhism really, you know, because Thailand was never colonized by European country, so Thai Buddhism, when I, when I, when I first went to, came to Thailand, you know, it was, Westerners just didn't know much about it. And, and then because it had never been colonized, they, you know, they never, you know, hardly any monks could speak English or things like this. So, so Westerner, non-Thai people coming into Thailand found quite difficult because where Burma was the most logical place to go back in 1960 because the Burmese had been British colony there's a lot of cultural exchange and a lot of people spoke English in Burma and there were meditation teachers and Sri Lanka also and uh, but when I when I came to Thailand and Burma was shut off you wouldn't couldn't go there anymore. I would have gone to Burma actually. But um, the government there, you know, became a real tyranny and and then you couldn't I mean I think they'd give you a visa for a week back in nineteen sixty six. 
that was it. But so Thailand, you know, was the logical place to go. You know, and but it, it but hardly any Westerners knew anything about Thai Buddhism then. Which has changed now, is it? And so what impressed me was you heard certain like expatriate people living in Bangkok for having views and opinions about Thai Buddhism. But from what I could tell, you know, even before I understood the Thai language, but you have these teachers like Buddha Dasa or Bhagavad Gita. And they were, you know, they were they were teaching the, the real, you know, the direct approach. No mucking about, you know, it was <laughs> and so what better what more could you ask? You know, you didn't have they didn't ask you to believe in all the you know, the cultural conditions and that. So it was it was easy, you know, I found it easy to adapt on, on that level because I wasn't, you know, dealing with a lot of cultural things that didn't mean anything to me. I was dealing with suffering and its causes and the sensation all the time in my life at Potnapo. And then then I could, you know, I could use the traditional form and the Thai culture, you know, as it affected me. I could be aware of it rather than just dismiss it or blindly follow or, you know, just go along with everything without question or you know, forming my own opinions. I, you know, the direction was always observing rather than, than just putting up with things or going along with things or feeling you had to conform out of, to be accepted and things like that. You can feel much more sense of this is something I can do, something of value. Well, speaking of anatta and going on and letting go and these sorts of things, how do you, can you give some words of suggestions about self-discipline within that, without know, getting, you know, too worried about the, like, I really got to be a good chant or I really got to wear my robe, right? I see there's some importance there, but maybe you can talk about that, the importance of self-discipline as the path to not so. Well, like, the important thing is to be aware of you know, how you take the idea of self-discipline can be a, a form of tyranny. You know, I should be, and uh, one can be, a, you know, caught up in, in ideas, I'm not disciplined enough, I'm, or you, you become, you're trying too hard to be perfect, whatever. Or you've got views, oh, that rubbish, you know, it's not important, just mindfulness is enough, there's some of that's the other extreme. So then you, but my suggestion is observe. Whether, you know, you think it's rubbish, it's like this, or, or, uh, or you think, you know, it's obsessive and it makes you more tense and, and uh, worried about everything, then, you know, you're observing, this is grasping this by becoming obsessed with the form. But like in the early years, I mean, that's, you have to learn the form so you can let it go. <laughs> now you, you have to, you know, you can't just, like, you know, you, you learn how to the structure around you. That takes a certain amount of determination and discipline. And, and surrender to it. But that's not the end. It's merely you getting so that it becomes uh, something you can let go of because it's, it's you've internalized it rather than just grasp the external form. Then you become more aware of how you, you know, how the thing and how Theravada Buddhism affects you or Vinaya or, or uh, there's various views and interpretations about what Buddha really taught or, or you know or how you should keep the Vinay and things like this so you come across the, you know in your life there's so many views and opinions but uh, 
the important thing is to is to observe, like like I determined, I was just going to do it the way they do what about poem? Because that that seemed to you know that's what everybody agreed to there. That's what I done saw encouraged in the month. So do it that way, and so then uh, I developed that. Uh, but then then other people come along and saying, oh, I mean, I really said you should do this, shouldn't do this or do that, and then then you get into into arguments about it and doubts. But that's not the point, you know, to get it perfect, but to 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 get used to the the, the container so that you, I I call it like internalizing it, like when you learn to play a musical instrument, you know, you have to go through boring practice routines, da 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 da, da over and over, <laughs> while learning. Uh, to dance, you know, you got to repeat these steps and and over and over till they till they internalize, they come naturally. And so it's, it's uh, uh, you know, so then you after a while they just become the way you you know you don't have to think about what string do I pluck. <laughs> it just you know. On a deeper level, and just uh, from the material level, and that comes to to practice, then rather than to you know, it's not something you're born with and know immediately from the day one how to play the piano, unless you're Mozart. <laughs> and then it, and that's why what, what I always felt with Lupo Cha was. Uh, you know, he seemed so at ease with it within the container of the of the Vinaya, and it didn't seem a struggle, or he, he, he was completely relaxed within the structure, and it was just natural. So you didn't get the impression he was keeping any rules at all. You know, it wasn't like that was, uh, and then like going to England the first time. And I could see he could size up situations and adapt to to particular contingencies that arose that he, he might never encounter here in Thailand. But because it was done through mindfulness, rather than through, it's got to be like this or, you know, it's wrong. So it's interesting to see somebody like that who's so admired here in this country. You know, and we spent the week before we came to London in Bangkok and then all these people coming to see him and bowing and, and everybody the Thai culture so polite so graceful so uh, you know devoted and I thought that's not how it's going to be in London <laughs> so we so, have Bangkok to London, and then and I just I was, I was really impressed the way he could he tune in, he'd observe, he'd observe how the English did things, or he was quite interested in in getting to know. You know, he doesn't try to make everybody do it his way. But he has a certain kind of grace, and and, uh, and you know, greatly admired, even though he couldn't speak English. People thought, you know, people that came really developed kind of overnight a kind of trust and respect for him. It's a uh, years ago, I remember that Tom Sang Patton and, and Ajahn Chah and I were walking on top, you know, the hill and and he was saying, uh, so Mezo, you must be confused, because uh, the Dhamma is all about letting go, and Vinaya is about singing. And so, I, yeah, I do find that a paradox, <laughs> And so, <laughs> and, uh, he said, well, when you, when you figure that one out, you'll be okay. <laughs> 
and this this is an important thing, you know, because it's that like form is this way. Like deny is all about form, containment, restriction, and deny and dhamma is about letting go everything. You know, no form. Unborn, uncreated, and yet when the Buddha was before he passed on, you know, Ananda said, "What do we do without our teacher? And you're gone. Who does I leave you, Dhamma and Vinaya?" So, and it, this uh, he didn't say just Dhamma; he said Vinaya also. Now, this I find it like in the in the West, people aren't really interested in the Vinaya, but in the Dhamma. This is one of the problems living there, I found, was was they love Dhamma, but they don't, you know, the Vinaya is something that they, you know, they go along with, but they don't really understand it, or really even some, you know, find even five precepts a struggle. <laughs> or I think you don't even need five precepts, you know. Dhamma is about letting go, being free, and so forth. So, it, it, you know, there's that. That's what people love in Dhamma, because it is. It's beautiful. It, it, you know, it has this sense of not being bound and contained and restricted and bound into forms and rules and traditions and religions and all these things that people are very critical of now in the West. And this idea of freedom, you know, express yourself, do what you want, is very attractive option, but then where does it go, you know, where does it stop, and so then the, the form, uh, you know, the, you know this, this, uh, and this is a traditional form, it's not a form that is up for option, you know, for negotiation, you know, we, I don't like these rules, I just change them kind of thing, it's, it's like you, when you join the club, you go, you have to, this is the Categorical imperative, you know. This is what this is what you have, this is what you expect. They're not negotiable. So, so then that in some way that, that makes our life much more easy because if we end up try to negotiate on that level, there's no end to it. It's just always this person's view and that person's feelings, and 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 we just go on and and on and create endless uh, problems with each other and with the tradition and with various individual preferences and ideas. So, what we do, you get accused sometimes of being old-fashioned, or, you know, some, I've been accused of being attached to tradition, of being, you know, here I'm supposed to be free from attachment, and I just made us attached to the Thai forest tradition. Some people think that. So, and that might how it how they might how they might see it, you know, because in the way they think and, and interpret life. That, uh, but my experience has been that that it, um, you know, it it is a it, I see it as a kind of precision tool if used properly. And that's why I don't, I don't want to change it. You know, I don't want to make it British or American or, you know, Western Buddhism. And it's, it's got its point. It's a tradition that has managed to survive up to the, this moment. And, and so it must have a power within it. Otherwise it would have been changed all over the place. Like in Buddhism, you know, like in, in England. You've got every variation on the theme of Buddhism there. You know, if you don't like this, there's uh, other options, you know, uh, other groups. And there's Zen, and then there's Tibetan, and then there's modern psychotherapeutic Buddhism, and Vipassana without Buddha, and things like that. There's everything, you know, all kinds of alternatives and options on the theme. So. It, you know, it's, this is why you know I feel very committed to trying to keep this this within the 
the tradition to make it available for those who see, you know, want to use it and see it value. Because there's, there's so many other, you know, I see, you know, like the Vipassana movement in the States is, you know, that, you know, has a, a certain, you know, the certain admirable things about it, but it doesn't have that precision to it. It doesn't cut clearly through that ego. And if you, you know, like they're talking about the three fetters, and, and that it's really these three fetters, I mean, you can come from very good intentions, wanting to, you know, the best for everybody in the world, and and practice to, as a bodhisattva, to help all sentient beings. But it still can be operating from the three fetters. You see, so so in this way, it you you actually going to the to the fetters, the obstructions, right off, right from the beginning, not to annihilate, but to understand them, so that they're not confusing you or blinding you. And once you you really see through those, because they're, they're artificial things. They're, like sexual desire is not artificial, it's part of nature, the nature of the body, or anger, self-preservation, uh, all this is part of the package of being a human being, being a mammal, learning to survive. It's, it's just, it's not created by human society. But the first three fetters are all creations of society. Of, you know, why languages and cultures and tribal people, Muslims, Hindus, Christians, the whole lot, you know, there's this, these are created by human thought, human ideas. They're not given to us in nature. Your body's a natural condition. You know, so, it, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it is human body is, is a part of me. Consciousness is natural. It's not, it's, you don't create consciousness through culture. So you, you've got consciousness and the body as just part of nature. This realm here, this earth, this planet, the trees and the mountains and the oceans and so forth, and all the animals and the mosquitoes and the birds and whatnot, they're all involved in this in this sense realm of feeling natural conditions that is what we call nature it's, it, it's not created by any individual but the self is created by human human uh, ignorance and desire and uh, culture and social identities and thinking thinking is a creation <coughs> So then, like in the West, you, you know, you find they develop the thinking process to a high level, the logic and reason and the intellect using these various forms of intelligent thinking, reasonable thinking, logical thinking, scientific, uh, you know, which is very impressive, but it's still created by human beings that have not awakened to Dhamma. They might be brilliant, you know, on that level, but it's still, still, uh, it's like a dippy feel about the Brahmasa which you can't tell. So in this, in this, this uh, direct approach of the Buddha, you know, he gave very clear directions, you know, do this. So it's, you know, you're, you're not trying to attack the ego or get rid of your sense of self, you're, you're understanding it. And that understanding, is not ego. You know, this this which is aware of my ego is not ego. But I can't if I say I'm aware or I'm mindful or something, then it can becomes ego. So you don't say anything, but you recognize, you discern this this state of just being present and in, in, in this wide spectrum of awareness, where it's not concentrate on any object but just open and receptive in the moment 
even though that's a natural state, but we, you know, our societies tend to always make us focus on something to, you know, to uh, engage in something or other, some object. So we, you know, we don't, we don't really appreciate this, this mindful satisapatanya. We have samadhi, you know, like we learn to concentrate the mind on, on a reading or on some object. But to just not be concentrated on an object, but concentrated in this more wide open way is satisapatanya. And that's where the, the discerning ability of panya operates. Now that's important, it's, it's like the thinking mind is a critical function, so it says this is good, this is bad, this is right, this is wrong, this is higher, lower. But this is, but this uh, Satisambhachanya, Panya, is not critical. Uh, so you use this discerning. It knows the difference between self and non-self. There's a knowing. Self is like this, non-self, and not those like this. Or uh, worldly attachment, samsara is like this, nibbana is like this. You discern, you discern the difference. And it's not saying nibbana is better, but nibbana is like this. And then you, you can see, like, samsara is, uh, if you attach to samsara, then you get whirled away into the momentum of, of those cycles. So when you begin to see the result of being just being heedless and caught into that, then you, you know, you, you, you determine, well, there's no point doing that anymore, I know that. Because sometimes in monastic life we, you know, we want to be good monks and we have ideals of being, you know, content with little and and uh, and keeping the Vinaya properly and and we have these are ideals of, of monastic life and then you know then you can be sometimes feel you know hopeless because you can't live up to these ideals all the time you can't be as good as you imagine you should be so we can take the ideal of bhikkhu life, of monasticism, and attach to the ideal of it, and then create misery for ourselves because we, we feel guilty about a greed for food, or sexual desire, or anger, or jealousy, and things like this. We, we shouldn't have that, I'm not a very good bhikkhu because I'm jealous, or greedy. And I mean, then we create these judgments about ourselves. Or, because I, you know, I remember in the old days, some of the Western monks used to idealize the bhikkhu to the point where they couldn't actually do it anymore, because they were always failing. They could never, you know, be as good as they felt they should be. So they gave up. Where, uh, you know, I, I, I could see, you know, I can't, I, I, you know, I'd like to be the best and a really good monk and have unlimited compassion for all beings. I mean, on the ideal level, this is, this is beautiful stuff. But in the Vipaka come to the moment, sometimes it isn't like that at all. It's like, you know, a very selfish, very negative attitude, feelings arise, fears. But this is where, you know, your all conditions are impermanent, and so you you realize anything par, you know, is grist for the mill, whether it's good or bad, high or low, ideal or not. And so then you you find your confidence in this awareness that you investigate. 